Hey there, everyone. I'm Fred. I'm a software engineer at Offchain Labs, building out Arbitrum. And today I'm going to be talking about a couple of different patterns that you can use Create Tools for. And the reason I'm, uh, I wanted to do this talk is mostly because this is one of my favorite building blocks to do stuff, uh, both only on Ethereum or when you're doing cross-chain stuff. Over at Offchain Labs, we think a lot about like not only things you can leverage on your smart contracts on Ethereum, but also like what are the different cross-chain interactions that you can do and interesting, the interesting things that you can build with that. And I don't think I'll be able to like go very deep into everything I wanted here, or I'll try to like cover the general surface of the different ideas and cool stuff. So if you want to dig deeper, find me after. I'll be around all day long, so we can chat. So yeah, uh, maybe let's start with like what is Create Two? Oops, wrong slide. Uh, create Two is an opcodes that you can use to create a smart contract. Uh, there are different ways that you can actually like create a smart contract, right? If you're sending a transaction to the null address, uh, you create a smart contract with the init codes that is in the data field, and the address is determined by a hash of whoever is sending this transaction and the nonce of that transaction. And you have an opcode that does something similar for smart contracts. Uh, for smart contracts, you can create, use the regular create opcode that does the same thing using the nonce of the smart contract and the address of the smart contract. And then there was this EIP 1014, the Slim Create 2. And what it does is it adds more flexibility into like how this address is actually generated. And for this, I want to take back to the previous slide. That is, what are the things that when we're actually creating this smart contract address, what are the things we want to enforce? And I think these are the two main points, at least from my perspective. That is, you want this address to be unique so that when you're referencing it, sending an asset or interacting with something, that's the only one it is. And the second one is deterministic. So like before you actually do the deployment, all that, you can actually know what's going to happen. And yeah, uh, something else, also like you'll see through all my slides, there are a couple of things that I strike through because if you use self-destructs together with create two, you can do a lot of more interesting patterns as well, but there are many people who want to remove self-destruct, so I'll try to not mention those too much so that people don't get too tempted. Uh, I'd advise not using that on mainnet in case it gets removed, otherwise your contracts may break. But yeah, uh, here's some solidity code on how you might like deploy a contract. This is a regular create. You will get the nonce of the smart contract uh, and deploy it. So the address here will, de will be determined in like the regular normal way. And then we, this is the formula, some formalization. I'll skip through since this is an advanced uh, session. Uh, and here's a create too. Uh, there's this neat syntax in solidity that it's pretty similar to what you saw before, but you can specify a salt that is used. And that's the main difference of create two. That is, instead of depending on the nonce of the deployer and the sender address, you instead deploy, you depend on the salt and what you're, and the init code of what you're actually deploying. Uh, and this allows you to do a lot of interesting stuff because that means that the smart contract itself has a lot more control over like what this address of this new smart contract, like this child, will become. And this allows you to leverage a lot of different use cases. But the two main things that I'd say are the things that it enables is one is counterfactuals. And by that, what I mean is you can interact with an address. Even though there isn't something deploys there, you know eventually there will be something. And the second one is you can actually use this to encode data in a smart and sneaky way to, to do different things. But yeah, uh, this. Uh, if you look at the EIP, this is how it happens. Uh, this is how the address is determined when you're doing a create two. Uh, you, there's some like gotchas. If a contract was already deployed there, as we said before, we want it to be unique. So this will actually fail if you use the same salt that was used before. I believe high level solidity will revert if you're trying to deploy, but if you're doing low level stuff, it will just return the zero address. So that's a common pitfall, be careful. Uh, and another interesting thing that is a lot of people might not be aware of it, that it, you can actually resurrect contracts using Create2. And by that I mean it's a deterministic salt and the init code. So if you deploy something that has a self-destruct, it self-destructs, you can deploy there again. And there are some interesting things that happen with that. For example, when I was like exploring this, it turns out that Etherscan and their contract verification, they weren't fully like able to handle this. So you could do like, some annoying things that, for example, you deploy a contract with a pure function that returns two, you self-destruct, and you deploy the same thing, but now it returns three. And for you to handle these things in display, like, it can get quite a bit tricky. Yeah, so as I said before, what are the things you can actually do with Create2 that you couldn't before with Create? 
And I think the best, the two main things, at least that I'm aware of and I've explored, are these two that I mentioned before, right? Counterfactuals and just encoding data. And of course, the two together. And now I'm going to run through a couple of like the different things that you can do with that. Uh, and the way I'll do this is there's one big use case that I'm a fan of that I'll do the separate building blocks and then put them all together. So let's see how it goes. Ah, and by the way, this might be a bit dense. So if anyone wants any clarification as I'm going through, feel free to just raise your hand, uh, ask questions throughout, it's not a problem. So yeah, so there's this thing you can do which is like a lazy counterfactual wallet. So pretty much, you know you have a factory that will eventually deploy your wallet to a certain address. A cool thing that you can do is you can start sending your tokens to that address before it's deployed. And you deposit your ERC20s, your 721s, whatever, and then eventually you actually do the create two so that you have a wallet that controls those assets. You can have this like lazy wallet creation approach. Uh, and there are other things that you can do on top of that. Just to give some context on the strike through here is, for example, I think there's an MEV whale on mainnet that they have a smart contract wallet that never keeps its code on chain. And what they do is whenever there's an interaction that they want to claim, they, they do their MEV, they send it to this random address. Then in a separate transaction, what they do is they deploy their wallet, claim the money, then self-destruct, all in the space of one single transaction. And that way, they always try to like reduce the visibility that is there. I mean, that we can instrument the EVM, see what's going on. But it makes it more annoying for someone who's just looking around Etherscan and that stuff to actually understand what they're doing. Yeah, that's one thing you can do. There's another cool thing you can do, uh, but many of you here have read the Uniswap contracts. And since you have this deterministic creation of like the smart co of the contract address, you aren't only dependent on the nonce of the deployer, like the Uniswap factory or something like that. And what that allows you to do is be able to easily find out like the address of a particular pool between two tokens. And the way that works is for the salt, uh, first of all, you need to have the same init code for every single like child contract that gets deployed. And then the second thing is you can just have the salt be the token A and token B. And that way anyone can easily just infer what is gonna be the pool address without actually having to do an external call or having to query or have any kind of like extra knowledge, which is a cool thing. And to add the cross chain element to this, that is something we actually did at Arbitrum, is in our token bridge, uh, a really cool thing we wanted to do is we wanted to have an oracle for L2 token addresses. So what we do is, we did something very similar, that is we have an L2 factory for, for tokens, and the salt it uses to deploy these L2 tokens is the L1 token address. So that means that if you know the, the hash of the init code on the L2 and the address of this factory, on the L1 you're always able to know the address of an L2 token, and you can interact with nice cross-chain transactions that way, and you have, more you have more visibility of information even though you can't query that state because it's all encoded in a, in a structured way that you can leverage. Yeah, another really cool thing is that you can encode information to the address itself of a contract. So instead of having like, you have a knownable proxy, you have an owner, you usually just store that as a constant or immutable or something, it's in your code, whoever the owner is. But something else you could do, for example, is what if the salt of this proxy that gets deployed is encoded with this owner address? So instead of reading from storage or anything like that, you just prove that the contract itself can know who is its factory, like on the constructor you check who, who deployed it, and then you just check like, oh, is the salt used, uh, if I check the message that's sender for the owner, is the salt used actually my owner? And this way you add a bit more execution, but you can like let go of stuff instead of storage. And this one I'd say maybe isn't worth it on, on every use case, but it's just an interesting way that you can leverage and do fancier stuff with this pattern in mind. Yeah, this one is one that I actually had this idea the day that my talk got accepted here. Like, Franzi sent me an email like, hey, you're gonna get to talk about Create 2s, and I was like, that's great timing. I just thought of this cool idea that I also want to talk about. And yeah, uh, you might have seen like, I think it's 677, the standard, I don't know, uh, the transparent call token standard, uh, not the one from Gnosis chain that had the bug. Uh, it's actually a different function that actually people expect to have this callback. And it has a really cool characteristic that is you can do a transfer and then do an arbitrary call after that. And the reason I really like that pattern is because it allows in a single transaction for you to compose more functionality together with that. And that allows for like interesting UX improvements because users 
like, at least I hate when I need to send a transaction, wait half an hour, send another transaction, wait 15 seconds, I don't know, have to manage my gas, all that. It's a real pain. And this way you have a single transaction for the user to manage, look through this scan, all that, and it composes all the UX for them. But not everyone implements that, the transfer and call, be it from a token, in the protocol itself, stuff like that. And this second screenshot, I took it from Aave v3, and they have a withdraw functionality. You have your tokens there, you want to withdraw it, they allow you to transfer it to someone. But they don't allow you to do a call after that to compose more functionality and stuff like that. And the cool thing that you can do is, you can encode the follow-up call into a create2 address as well. And by that, what I mean is, instead of withdrawing to your own account, you can withdraw to an address, which is the result of a create2 that composes the functionality that you want to do. And the general idea of that is, for example, it's kind of like flashbots, execution markets, all that, that whoever like claims like a searcher can know that if they deploy that contract that will trigger the withdrawal, they get a fr fraction of your tokens as long as like the contract will execute the rest of the logic for you. And that is a bit more expensive. It has at least the overhead of another contract deployment and all that, but it allows for an interesting UX. And this no won't necessarily be very good for production because of costs and all that, but it also, again, allows for a different use cases and some interesting UX like things you can do. Yeah, there's also two big things that I think are, one big thing that I think is annoying, that is discoverability on top of that, right? That is, you're telling a user to withdraw just to this random address with no code, kind of weird, right? You need to trust a lot that everything is working correctly and that stuff will work, otherwise users lose money and never nice. But yeah, uh, you also don't have very good discoverability, right? Because you don't know if someone's withdrawing to a particular UA that hasn't been used before and stuff like that. But I think it works pretty well for narrow use cases. That is, if you have an indexing service that is looking particularly for like Aave withdrawals to compose specific functionality to integrate with something else, then it works. Uh, and you're able to like do services that are able to, to handle that. Yeah, and now this is the big one that I'm quite passionate about. And it's putting a lot of these ideas together and making one way to bridge NFTs with an interesting set of trade-offs and I'd say it's the cheapest way to make an NFT bridging like in terms of deposits. And yeah, uh, I'll work through this slowly. Uh, I'm curious, how much time do I have left? Uh, I should have. Perfect, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so imagine a line cutting here through the middle. To the right, we have Ethereum. And to the left, we have an L2 or a separate chain, whatever. And this has a couple of things that you saw before being put together in order to leverage this. And I'll start with an interesting characteristic that is you only need one-way communication for this to work. You only need the two, the two layers just need to talk about the withdraw. And the idea here is you can use a create two to actually instead of like, well, let me give some more context before. That is whenever you're bridging an asset, you aren't actually transferring this asset to a different domain, be it Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, whatever. What you're usually doing is you're sending it to somewhere where it's escrowed and then a synthetic asset is being created that represents a right to redeem this original asset. And the way it works is you escrow it, then this escrow contract tells the one on the separate domain like, hey, I have the escrow, you can give him a synthetic asset. And then whenever the user wants to withdraw, they send back this synthetic asset and when you send back this synthetic asset to the original domain, it releases the escrow and that's how you create a bridge like synthetic assets with a right to redeem. And the cool thing you can do here is, instead of actually having an explicit smart contract that handles the escrow and does all that, you can rely on local verification. And by that, what I mean is, you just do a transfer on the NFT. Like before in the execution market, you send it to a random address with a commit. And the idea is that this commit is pretty much the information you're saying that on the separate domain you're agreeing to. And what that is, it can be something like this. That is, for example, you're saying, I'm depositing this token with this token ID. This is the user who's going to mint it on the separate domain. This is the chain ID where it comes from. This is the chain ID is going to. And a nonce, just because, I don't know, it's good to have nonces, right? Allows you to redo stuff. But yeah, going back here. The idea is that you start the flow by doing the deposit, and then you can ignore the source where you're at. Go to the other side, and you use the same commits you used on this create2, and you mint that NFT. And the idea is that this NFT represents a right to redeem this commit. And there are certain things for this to work 
that you need to have as part of the commit. And one of them is you always need to validate whoever is the person who's going to initiate this action on the other side, like the, whoever is the message.sender calling this mint. And the NFT just keeps track of this commit. And all the factory needs to do is when a withdrawal is happening, they're like, this NFT that was created with this commit wants to make a withdrawal. So it sends it back to the source chain. And the source chain has a factory with deploys with this salt of the commit. And that allows you to withdraw the, the 7 to 1s or whichever NFT or whichever thing you want to withdraw. And the cool thing about this is you're able to like throw stuff around that instead of like, you have a really cheap deposit flow. That is, I, I'd argue this is actually the theoretical lower bound you can have for like bridging something. Because all you do is literally the transfer. You always need to do a transfer or a transfer firm or something like that. And then a mint. Those are the two minimal building blocks for anything you want to bridge. And here's, this is literally everything you do. But there's the trade-off that you're pushing the complexity to the withdraw side. And I have a repo with an initial implementation of this. Over here, the C2C NFT bridge, the create two counterfactual NFT bridge. And one of the questions that I'm thinking through that is, I think there is an interesting way, I'm not sure yet, to manage this nonce so that you actually never need to do a withdrawal. Because for example, for an NFT in particular, you, if all you care about is provenance, one thing you can do is, what if you do a deposit from Ethereum to Arbitrum, for example, but instead of withdrawing, what if you do the same thing but reversed? Like you deploy the same system, but the parts are reversed. So you do another deposit again, which is also just the transfer and the mint. And you can do an infinite chain of those. And the problem is at a certain point, you lose the guarantee that you'll be able to withdraw because this chain just becomes too large of stuff going forward and backwards. But if you have a way to settle this in O of one, like managing the nonces in a clever way, you can actually pull this off. I wasn't able to figure out that part yet, but if anyone wants to look through the repo and has ideas, there are some open questions there. And also, yeah, since there were time constraints, I also put a couple different links here of different stuff people have done with Create 2s, if anyone wants to read more. And yeah, uh, Shill, we're hiring. If you want to join and work on cool stuff. And yeah, uh, it's my Twitter. Anyone can DM, talk about this, I'll also be around. And yeah, I guess I'm a bit over time, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we, I think we will take one question, and in the meantime, the next speaker can get set up. Thanks. So for NFTs minted on the L2 side, uh, do you have to do the whole reverse thing? Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. Um, so the, what you explained, does it work for NFTs minted on L2? Yeah, so if you want to do like the regular flow is you do the mint on that side and you do a deposit here, the mint just gives you the right to redeem eventually. The thing that I was saying is like you can deploy this system in parallel but with reverted sides. That starts getting a bit complex. We can talk about that later. But yeah, here in this like the simple version, all you do is you do the mint and you do the transfer and that's it. And then you withdraw which gives you the right to, to claim it. Thanks. Okay, one more, and then on to the next. Not a question, more of a random idea. Could you use the same system on a single chain to like bundle NFTs together by sending them all to the same create two address? Probably, and another thing that you could do maybe is you could do the same system for wrappers on the same chain, right? And maybe there's a cool way you can try to obfuscate the trading thing using wrappers and stuff like that. And yeah, the cross-chain domain approach is just one instantiation of this. The same pattern, it can work for multiple different things, not only NFTs as well. And yeah, we can explore that idea later, so. Okay, uh, another round of applause for Fred. Thank you.